welcome to the Ray Harryhausen podcast, the show dedicated to the life, career and films of a special effects titan. Join us as we host in-depth discussions about the work, influences and legacies of this uniquely talented filmmaker. Brought to you by the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation, we will be delving into Ray's archive to bring a unique insight into his work, including exclusive audio from the man himself. We will be joined by special guests for retrospectives, exclusive announcements and competitions, so this podcast is a must-listen for all fans of the world of Ray Harryhausen, animation and classic filmmaking. Hello and welcome to episode 26 of the Ray Harryhausen podcast and part 4 of our musical retrospective on the music from Ray Harryhausen films and today we will be focusing on the two Sinbad films of the 1970s. Uh, Firstly The Golden Voyage of Sinbad from 1973 and then Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger from 1977. And I'm joined once more by Foundation trustee John Walsh, who has very happy memories of both of these movies. Hello, John. Hello, Connor. Yes, I have, have cinematic memories of seeing these these movies and uh, and the wonderful music which has followed me through my um, through my own life and career. And you're somebody that was that was there. You saw. You, did you see both of these films in the cinema when you were when you were younger, or uh, were you were you around for for the Golden Voyage? I did, despite my, my youthful appearance. I'm much older than I look. So I think I've been hanging around the Fountain of Youth with Kura, I think, for too long. But yes, in 74, uh, uh, for Golden Voyage of Sinbad, and of course 77 then for Eye of the Tiger. So both were cinema experiences for me locally in uh, in South London. And both were spectacular and and pivotal points. You know, often people talk about seeing Ray's films and deciding to be filmmakers. And for me, it was Golden Voyage of Sinbad in 74. And by the time 77 happened and it was Sinbad in the Eye of the Tiger, I'd had a, I got a Super 8 camera for my parents and, uh, and it all began. And I get the feeling that for a lot of people, race films were this kind of oasis of a, a specific type of filmmaking that no one else was really doing and certainly was quite difficult to see at the cinema at that time, including the soundtracks uh, up until sort of the late 70s when, when Star Wars happened and, and everything changed. Was that your perception at the time? Yes, I mean, if um, I mean, I was very young when I saw uh, Golden Voyage Sinbad. I would have been about five or six, so I wouldn't have had a record collection. Uh, by the time I the Tiger came along, I was more interested in film soundtracks, but actually, you couldn't find them in record shops that easily, and you couldn't even order them from uh, from a record shop like W. H. Smith, which would have had vinyls and cassettes or Woolworths. So you were quite limited by what they were buying into stores and to shops. Um, there was an LP vinyl release in 1974 in Great Britain for um, the Golden Voyage of Sinbad, but I didn't know that. I mean, I started buying soundtracks on vinyl. It would have been much more mid to late 80s. And then, of course, it's being aware of where to buy them and then being able to afford to buy them are two separate issues. Um, now, of course, I have everything I want in every version I want it in. Um, on every format I could possibly imagine. Um, so now it's, it's. I'm not going to say it's less special, but had somebody bought me the um, vinyl of Golden Voyage of Sinbad in the late 70s, early 80s, I would have remembered, and I would have remembered who gave it to me and unpacking it and listening to it and so on, because film soundtracks were as rare as hen's teeth back in the day. Um, and even when CDs came along... You'd have to go to somewhere like Tower Records in London or the brilliant 58 Dean Streets at 58 Dean Street in Soho where you would find just wonderful things on vinyl, cassettes and CD if you could afford it. So um, great times, great times. Uh, uh, today now uh, we have all of the soundtrack releases to look at and the three CD releases for Ray's Golden Voyager Sinbad. Uh, the first... I'm looking at it here, it was from uh, Prometheus, which I've got the Prometheus label soundtrack, beautiful artwork. Uh, then it was released again by Prometheus as a double CD of the original soundtrack recording for the LP, which was made separate to the film recording, and all of the film tracks separately as mono. Now that's not uncommon because 
when a film is mixed, it would be in mono in theatres. So there'd be a mono version of what's called the music stems available when you're mixing the sound because the sound would be mixed with lots of separate elements, maybe, you know, eight or more elements. So it was always thought that either a stereo version of the full soundtrack either was never created or if it was, no longer exists. But of course, that's not true anymore, is it, Connor? Because there's a brand new release um, made by the good folks down at Entrada. Yes, the Entrada release, uh, which is which is very recent, it was released in 2016, um, has, has, it's packed a double CD filled with uh, different versions of the soundtrack. So it starts with that uh, original 1974 soundtrack release, which you, you could have bought on, on LP in the 70s if you were lucky. Uh, but then it moves on to the complete soundtrack, uh, the, the full stereo soundtrack for for the Golden Voyage of Sinbad, and that covers the best part of two discs. Um, there's there's sort of, um, I suppose, the entire run of the movie's worth of music in there. And then, as with as with many Intrada releases, we uh, we finish up with some extras, some unused material, and some alternative takes. You've got a, a real treasure chest of music there, and some fantastic liner notes too. So, uh, if you can seek out a copy of this Intrada CD, then it's well worth your time. And the fascinating thing about this CD is, of course, there's music that doesn't really appear in the film or or appears in different versions. Um, We're going to have a quick listen to one now. And uh, it was it was dialed out of the film and percussion material um, was substituted instead. I mean, the way this would have worked is Miklos Rocha would have seen in front of an orchestra a mute version black and white version of the film playing so that he could get the timings right for the orchestra and all of the orchestra would play the instruments in front of the film it's a similar situation as today now he would have already have done what's called a spotting session so he would have worked out his timings but he wouldn't be in charge of or be aware necessarily of where the sound effects would fall that would obliterate the music or where the dialogue would would come up and the music would come down so that's only a decision made really by a sound editor in in the mix with the film's director and producer often but here's have a listen to this this is called um, Kura challenges Sinbad to fight Carly slash Carly fight slash uh, green men put Mariana in the pit and this is the lovely stereo version that you can only hear on the Entrada release take a listen
the surprising thing about that Connor is the clarity of the sound again this is a recording from um, it would have been made in 1973 for the release in 74 I guess um, very good quality isn't it yes I mean it sounds fantastic and uh, I think that they've done a, a, a really great job of uh, of cleaning up these these tapes especially for a material that wasn't uh, wasn't used in the in the finished film and certainly wasn't available in previous soundtrack releases so um, you're really getting um, the full vision of Miklos Roja's soundtrack for The Golden Voyage um, at length and uh, yeah very interesting very interesting to hear loud and clear and uh, of, a, of an exceedingly high quality. Now Roja himself was um, born in Budapest and uh, he came to Britain um, in 1935 and worked at different orchestras and worked for ballet and so on. But he's, of course, quite famous for his Hollywood scores. And Ray was always a big fan, wasn't he, Connor, of uh, of Miklos Rocha and, and his work? Yeah, Miklos Rocha was definitely one of Ray's favourites. We have, within our archive, um, I would say most scores that Rocha ever composed, um, either on vinyl or on compact disc or even on cassette tapes too. Um, there's, there's a vast amount of, of music and I think it was one of the artists that really liked to listen to while he was drawing or while he was uh, uh, brainstorming or writing or, or sculpting. Uh, this was this is one of the artists that, that inspired him a great deal and uh, one, of, one of Ray's favourite films was The Thief of Baghdad which of course was a, was a fantasy movie with music from Miklos Roja and uh, it must have been a real highlight for Ray to, to have this composer on board for his uh, his film The Golden Voyage of Sinbad. And um, you think the f- he was in the footsteps of Bernard Herrmann, of course, because Bernie Herrmann had done four films for the uh, Harryhausen Schneer Collaborative, and uh, and and was no more. You know, Bernie had uh, had different views on film music and different views on his own career, so he so, sort of moved along. So Miklos Rocio seemed to be the um, the perfect choice, but it didn't go all as swimmingly as um, as everyone would have hoped. Often when a film is is made, the editing and post-production are the ends where the budget is tightest because had if there's been any overspend during the production of a film, then it's in editing, post-production, music and so on, and sometimes special effects and titles, where the, um, the cuts are made. So Rocha was promised a much larger orchestra for the original recording of... Uh, the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. During the production of the film, Miklos Rocha was hoping for a much larger orchestra for the uh, composition of the score, but of course budget restraints meant that it would be a smaller orchestra than he was used to. But I don't think that affects the music, Connor. When you listen to it, I don't think, um, certainly to my ear anyway, as, a, as, a, as an amateur, I mean, I'm not a musician, I'm not a composer, but it, it certainly works, doesn't it? You don't feel that it's, it's out of step with other films from the time. No, certainly. I think that the music for Golden Voyage is very effective. It's uh, it's filled with tension, and uh, it does sort of reflect the the slightly darker tone of, of the movie itself. And uh, I think that's something that works very well. One thing I feel about uh, about the the soundtrack for this film, again, as an amateur, as somebody who's not not a musical expert or a composer, but I feel like in comparison with the the Bernard Herrmann scores, it's it's a lot more subtle throughout the, throughout the film. There's not a whole lot of set pieces per se. It's more the certain motifs appearing throughout the movie in the background, sort of increasing the tension. And there's light and shade there as well, obviously, and it works for for the different characters. But you hear themes being repeated throughout the film, so in different manners and using different instruments. And uh, I feel like it, it flows together almost as one one long piece of music in a way rather than a, a selection of different tracks you know the the lack of a, a large orchestra certainly didn't hamper enjoyment or the effectiveness of of the soundtrack and uh, as we can hear from this extended and tragic release the the music works very well for the, for the themes of the film so do you have a piece in mind connor you're going to pop in now to uh, to treat the viewer and the listener Yes, I'm going to. Um, I've chosen the arrival of the homunculus, or as a, as its titles in the Entrada release, uh, homunculus drops tablet on Sinbad's ship. It's a uh, it's a piece from quite early on in the movie, but I think the uh, the use of synthesizer here is particularly effective because you've got the orchestra in the background, uh, and then this this hint of a sort of more modern electronic instrument. I think gives it a 
again, that occult feel, that slightly darker, uh, otherworldly feel, which suits some, some of the creations and some of the uh, creatures that Ray developed for, for this particular movie. <laughs> It's interesting, that sounds like a theremin to me. Theremins were used in classic um, science fiction films. I may be wrong, um, but it sounds like a theremin, which is um, which is a, certainly a synthesised style of equipment. and looked quite science fiction-ish in itself and was famously used, of course, by Bernard Herrmann in uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Um, we stand to be corrected on that, though it may not be a theremin. Well, I, t- I took a look in the liner notes here, and it just mentioned a synthesizer. But that was my thought too. Um, it, you know, that classic uh, theremin sound, recalling science fiction movies of the of the fifties and sixties. Of course, um, does give it an unsettling feel when it's mixed with the with the the sort of fantasy and uh, Arabian Nights style music, which you encounter throughout the rest of the film. It just gives the homunculus that extra otherworldly edge. Now, the film was originally um, having trouble finding a release because um, Screen Gems um, went to great efforts to get the soundtrack released in their own division, Bell Records. Um, But Bell Records had rejected the score outright because several previous soundtrack releases had sold poorly. But, I mean, you know, we gasp when we hear and we sigh when we hear these kind of comments. It's because it's due to distribution, not for lack of people wanting to buy it. Um, I would have saved up my pocket money and I would have bought the vinyl of Golden Voyager Sinbad if I'd known it was available and if I could have ordered it. You know, unlike today where you can order anything from anywhere in the world, at the time you were very limited even by what record shops would allow you to order because they had very limited back catalogues and the back catalogue would often be a a paper catalogue that they would thumb through and say, no, no, no soundtracks. Or it would be a soundtrack release um, that was a compilation of pop tunes or or contemporary tunes from the day. So um, earlier, Connor, I was talking about how the difficulty of finding soundtracks, um, you know, as a younger person and as a film student. What did you find in terms of looking for soundtracks? You know, were, were these things that you ever hunted down yourself? Well, I have to I have to admit that these days, if you want to hear a film soundtrack, 
95% of the time they'll be on Spotify or on uh, Amazon Music or one of these other streaming streaming services. So if you've got a subscription to, to any of these, then you, you more or less have the world at your fingertips. But of course, there is, uh, you know, for people who still like physical releases, um, the, the likes of, of Entrada and uh, all of these other wonderful record labels provide really high quality releases with with excellent liner notes and it just it's just a little bit of googling you can find all of this either through the uh, the websites themselves or or on amazon a lot of the time or, or ebay you can find some some hidden gems and of course uh, releases like this are often uh, limited edition so you have to be quick you have to be quick off the mark if you want to secure these high quality CD or, or even better vinyl releases, um, which which are, are there to be held onto and treasured. But yeah, that I mean that it, it does sound interesting. I suppose back when the film was first released, you might not even know if the soundtrack existed to be purchased or not, let alone where where you could buy one, um, which is which contrasts so much these days. You know, these days you can look at your phone and find out quite quickly um, where the soundtrack is, and you could probably be listening to it a few minutes later if you so desire. And the market for it's changed. I mean, years ago, um, partly due to union rules as well, a composer would sit down and do a suite of music. Jerry Goldsmith did this extensively on his film scores. And he would record separately for the album release. And then it would be a separate recording then for the actual film's mix. So you get this wonderful situation now where with Intrada and with some of the other labels, you'll get the original LP release remastered and then you'll get the original tracks from the film which do have slight variations or sometimes extensive variations and alterations and it is interesting for fans to have a listen to that and a few of Ray's films now are out in those forms including Clash of the Titans from Intrada you can get the full the full works um, on that one and we'll be talking about that a very special episode coming up next for that now as our final track from Golden Voyager Sinbad I've chosen a track called Centaur Attack Sinbad and it's on the Entrada um, double soundtrack release it's CD2 track number 21 and it's a very good example of um, what's called non-musical editing because the filmmakers chose to to edit um, out the music that had been recorded for this sequence and had been spotted and instead went through something much more percussive in post-production and uh, so effectively this music wasn't really heard in the film so this CD release gives a full sort of restoration of all of the music and it's uh, it's a magnificent five minute sequence but we'll only play a couple of minutes for you here but uh, just listen to what you could have heard in 1974 <laughs> Thank you. 
does seem a shame, doesn't it, Connor, that music like that is, is thrown to one side. But in fact, the reality for composers, very famous composers sometimes, their entire score for their entire film can be thrown out. There's no other way to describe it, thrown out. And there are some wonderful examples in film history. Of course, Alex North's score for um, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 was thrown out. And Alex North didn't know. He attended the premiere. And of course, Alex North, very well-known composer, Spartacus and lots of other wonderful films. Um, he found out when he was watching 2001 and found this temp track music, the Blue Danube and others, dialed into the film. He must have thought he was watching... Uh, an early cutting copy or something, but no, his score had been had been unceremoniously thrown away by Mr. Kubrick. It's a great score. It works very well on its own, and it's since been re-recorded by Jerry Goldsmith. And there are lots of examples. Jerry Goldsmith has had scores thrown away. John Barry has had scores thrown away as well. Um, but more about that perhaps uh, later on. What, what do you think about that, Connor, when you think composers have had their work just moved to one side and someone else has come in? Yeah, it seems unbelievable, and we've been talking a lot about lost movies recently. But yeah, lost uh, lost soundtracks is uh, another area of interest. Uh, I suppose again, it's a glimpse behind the curtain. Most people probably don't think a great deal about about the processes that go into uh, scoring a film, uh, and the idea that so much effort can go into putting an orchestra together, having having music, uh, spotting sessions and, and music which fits the movie, all of that effort to go into a piece of music which is eventually discarded, uh, it seems a little unbelievable. It seems like a lot of work for um, for something which is just going to be cast to one side. Um, but but when it happens to, to composers of, of that stature, of, uh, of John Barry and, and Alex North and, and all of these other um, le- now, now legendary names, uh, you do find it a little shocking. And I suppose it ties in with some of the things that we've spoken about in, in previous episodes of, uh, of pieces of film that have been discarded or thrown away um, th- throughout time from people who didn't perhaps recognise its future value. But I suppose that's the nature of the, of the film industry. It's, uh, it has to be quite ruthless sometimes. Now, to finish off, um, we've heard the final piece of music, but to get a final comment, our official conservator and restorer, Alan Friswell, who works extensively with the collection, bringing them literally back to life in some cases, this is what he had to say of his memories of the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. Uh, I think it's one of the best that Ray ever had. It's a classic piece of music. I know that Ray was absolutely delighted with it. it was, he was a great fan of Miklos Rocha anyway, so I know he was very, very pleased to, to have him on as, as to, to write the score. Uh, it fits the movie perfectly. It's, it conjures up a sense of time and place. It's got a, a real feeling of kind of ancient times and old and ancient magic. Uh, just when you hear the opening chords of the music when the, the titles come up, um, as a kid I remember just thinking this is a magical movie. Uh, Ray always said that music and sound is 50% of any film project and then this proves it undoubtedly it's, it's perfect for that film, it fits every scene uh, the sequence of Carly, the, the sense or everything uh, wonderful piece of music, flawless to my mind one of the best pieces of music that ever accompanied one of Ray's films and I know that uh, Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger is one of your favourites uh, one of your favourite of Ray's films and one that you have fond memories of but what are your feelings about the, the soundtrack by Roy Budd the, the music to well I, I might be I might be contrary to some opinions I don't think it's that bad I think as uh, Mike Hankin has said that when you hear the soundtrack by itself you can actually find lots of great values in it and Ray didn't hate it uh, Ray said there were some good things in it he felt that it was perhaps not quite as suitable as some of his other scores and he may be right it's. I, I think that it kind of fitted the sort of film that it was. I. I you know that obviously Golden Voyage is is a better film from in, in my opinion anyway. Uh, in every way, there's no question. Uh, it is the least of the three Sinbad films. I'm not. I'm not denying that. I. I, I agree completely. But there's a lot that I like about the film, uh, and I think the music in many places does work. Uh, it's just a matter of opinion, I suppose. So that's that's. I, I think it's pretty good. I think the music is okay. Fascinating to hear. And uh, we have another film up next in our double bill, don't we, Connor? What's, what's next? Yeah, that's right. So 
The next Ray Harryhausen movie of the 1970s was Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger, which was released in 1977, and this had music composed and conducted by Roy Budd. Have you heard many of Roy Budd's other soundtracks? I must say the only one I'm I'm very familiar with is uh, the, the classic score for Get Carter, which is about as far away from uh, Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger as I can really imagine. It's obviously a very different film and a different type of movie score as well. No, very much. And uh, he did the score, of course, for, for Wild Geese. So he was he's very much a composer who um, he seems not really the person you might ideally choose for this, doesn't he? I mean, he's not. I mean, even the score itself, we um, we opened there with a bit of music from the title sequence of uh, Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. It's a very different feel from Miklos Rocha and Bernard Herrmann. And it's actually more contemporary in, in some ways, Connor, wouldn't you say? Yes, I think so. I think it does uh, move away from that kind of uh, uh, the darkness and that kind of tension-filled uh, atmosphere which uh, which the Golden Voyage of Sinbad had. I suppose maybe by, by the late 1970s, um, more, more than ever, a, a Ray Harryhausen movie was almost a genre in its own right, and and but uh, this this was a time where people could could look back on on Ray's previous releases and uh, have an idea of the mu- music they might like to hear, or or music which had uh, which had now been around for the best part of of two decades or more. So this is um this is an interesting time in Ray's career for composers because there's a there's a quite some some big footsteps to follow, I suppose you could say. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, this you know, Roy Budd is definitely an accomplished composer, um, and he died spectacularly young. I think he was only in his forties when he died. But the contemporary stuff he was doing, like Get Carter and British crime thrillers, the Wild Geese, um, everything's coming up roses, um, which was the musical world of Stephen Sondheim. Um, he he, in some ways, was was quite the right fit because if you go all the way back to the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. Bernard Herrmann would be, would have been of a similar age and was on the cutting edge, on the cusp of uh, of what he was doing as well. Uh, interestingly, a, a kind of a small Harryhausen connection, uh, Get Carter was directed by Mike Hodges, who also directed Flash Gordon. Mike Hodges has contributed to our Harryhausen The Lost Movies book. He's uh, he's uh, one of the directors who's uh, who's been part of the forward. We have several directors who are part of that forward. More about that uh, later. Uh, do you have any tracks here, Connor, that you wanted to to kick off with? Yes. Well, I thought it would be uh, it would be nice to kick off with uh, with the, the the theme to one of the film's most iconic uh, characters and creatures, and uh, as a tribute to to Peter Mayhew, who very sadly passed away last month, we should listen to the Minotaur theme, which is uh, track five on the Castle release of nineteen ninety nine. Um, I think this is a, a great theme. I think this fits very well with uh, with that creature's um, unstoppable nature. I suppose he he's a he's an automaton. He's he's rowing the boat for Zenobia. He's following orders. Um, I suppose he's a a bit like the Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator from from ten years later, and that he's this machine that's uh, being built with a singular purpose. And I think the music fits that quite well. Thank you. 
Now the quality from that, it's sparkling news if it's only just been recorded, but um, of course it's um, it's from you know quite some time ago, isn't it, Connor? I mean, it's it was would have been recorded probably around the end of 1976 for the release of 77, and it was recorded by a hand-picked 76-piece symphony orchestra on the massive soundstage down at Wembley's famous CTS Studios. Um, and it's it's interesting. I don't think all of the music cues here, but most of them are, and they're in very good quality. So the, this film probably would have had a stereo release in some markets, and I think it works quite well. And as you say, when you talk about Arnold Schwarzenegger and you talk about the movie music from the eighties and nineties, this does seem to fit, I suppose, that more contemporary feel. Yes, the the uh, the unstoppable Minotaur and that idea of a. Uh, I suppose quite a repetitive, uh, a repetitive theme with with percussion. Um, I guess I suppose could be could be seen in a, in a lot of the uh, the action and science fiction film of the the nineteen eighties. Um, so I think as well. I think um, I think it works very well. What were your thoughts on the the soundtrack as a as a collector and as somebody who who knows a lot about music from from all of Ray Harryhausen's previous films? I thought the music for Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger was very different to Ray's other films, but then I think it's a very different film. It's probably the least favourite amongst fans when they rate Ray's three Sinbad films on both the film itself and on the music. But there are some pretty good key sequences there, and, and Roy's music really has helped it come alive. I think he's one of those composers who who works closely with the visuals and actually can add something. So rather than the music just sort of sitting in the background. Um, but what is a shame is that the full f- soundtrack has never been released. Castle Music are no longer in existence, as I understand it. And uh, this sort of digitally remastered sound is really wonderful. So it would be wonderful if they could find all of the other elements and all of the other music cues. Uh, most of them are here, but... Um, Again, it's that thing of, of, of hopefully finding the score and hopefully finding somebody to release the score. Yes, I hope so too. It would be wonderful to see a, a two-CD release of uh, of the score containing this original 17-track 17, 17 um, soundtrack release alongside the full score as well. And who knows, maybe some, some un- unheard material and some unused cues, because uh, it's always very interesting to hear this type of thing. Um, going back to your comments there, John, I think when we did our... Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger special back in episode 14 we invited uh, various people to, to comment on the film and uh, as always we, we don't mind people if they have any negative comments or, or, or any sort of um, sort of discerning opinions on the movie but both both positive and negative uh, one of the themes that kept um, popping up was this idea that a lot of the film was spent with the characters travelling you know moving from A to B or or making plans on where to go next and then and then travelling uh, together uh, through through these wonderful landscapes and I think that's where in my opinion this the soundtrack uh, comes alive the most because there's some, some really nice um, I suppose transitional music as, as the characters move through through the through the oceans and through snowy landscapes and uh, uh, the various magical continents that they encounter, so that that's I think where the music is strongest in my opinion. And yes, uh, I know that we we listened to the track "The Pyramid" in that previous episode, which is a which is one of your standouts. Yeah, let's take a listen now.
Yeah, I'm, I'm just transported listening to that. You know, the brass sounds, the string. I mean, it's wonderful. Um, you know, Ray was a big fan of film music. He used to listen to music all the time. And sometimes when he was animating and working at home in the workshop, he'd have vinyls on and cassettes. So he really loved these releases. I got him the um, various Entrada releases. I got him the Clash of the Titans release as well. He was around still for that. He loved it. He loved the uh, the booklet. Um, even though with his massive hands, the booklet looked even smaller. Um, I, ha- I had it scanned and so that he could read it up close. It's it's great. You know, he he was a fan of the music from his own films, quite rightly as he should be. And he was just a, a great aficionado when it came to film music. And I think it really shows, you know, all of Ray's films, the music is really standout. And when you can't afford the biggest crowds or the biggest sequence, sometimes music is needed to help the performance along. It's the uh, it's the invisible performance, as uh, some filmmakers call it. And I think it's been key. And during this sort of music special that we've done. We've had so much great feedback from everyone asking us questions and loving hearing the music. And it's been it's been wonderful. I'm sure Ray would have been uh, delighted that the music has been has been picked out separate from the animation, Connor, hasn't it? And we've done this this not so much a tribute because um I think people rightly recognize the music for what it is. I mean it, it most of these music, all of them, stand up well as accomplishments on their own. But I think it's marvellous that we've had this opportunity leading up to the centenary to to isolate the greatness of the sounds. Yes, in particular this this era, the 1970s, such a, a rich time for Harry Hosen fans because he had these two uh, these two fantastic films, but you also had a lot of uh, re-releases of, of previous movies such as Jason and the Argonauts and and uh, the seventh voyage of Sinbad, um, so so these films were were very much in the public consciousness at the time, and these soundtracks um, embedded themselves into people's minds. And I think music is such a powerful thing; it can it can bring you back to to an earlier time, to to a, a different version of yourself, really, and uh, bring back a lot of happy or sad or or entertaining memories. So. I think it's been really great to delve in in such detail and it's it's a wonderful resource to have all of these uh, CD releases. We're very lucky to have this music at our fingertips these days and explore a very important element of, of Ray Harryhausen's work and it's something that Ray's daughter Vanessa says quite often that he would listen to music you know, in the house regularly, every Sunday they would sit together and listen to something from from his vast collection. Um, Miklos Roja is the name, I must say, that pops up most often. That seems to have been a particular favourite. But but Max Steiner and, and all of these great composers uh, were very important to read. Now, on some of the Blu-ray releases, you can find the film soundtracks completely separate and you can listen to them throughout. And I think that's the case on... on uh, all three of the Sinbads in their recent Blu-ray releases. And as Connor said, if you haven't listened to our Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger special where we talk at more length about um, Roy Budd, then you can you can have a listen to that. Um, but to give you a bit more information, uh, Roy was born in London in 1947. He taught himself to play the piano by ear and uh, later mastering the Wulitzer organ as well, which was the organ that would be most often played in cinemas. Uh, but sadly, he died um, on the 7th of August 1993 from a brain hemorrhage, and he was aged just 46. So there was so much more to get from Roy Budd, and it's a shame that um, this was the only film that he did with Ray Harryhausen. But of course, the next film up was to be Ray Harryhausen's last film. It wasn't planned to be his last. It turned out that way. Um, we have much more information on that, and about the music as well, because... The music for that film was created by the wonderful Lawrence Rosenthal. And originally, somebody else had been asked, uh, someone very famous had been asked, but they were unavailable. And someone equally as famous actually did some music for Clash of the Titans. And uh, Connor, you've been very clever and uh, very resourceful in finding um, an example of that music, an original, the only original recording of that music from that person we won't reveal any more until the next episode, but uh, we won't reveal names, etc. But how did you feel, Connor, when you found the cassette? Well, needless to say, when I realised what it was that I was holding and I realised that uh, that I could listen to it, we've got a, a wonderful cassette recorder here in the archive, so I very carefully uh, plugged, plugged the tape in to, to record its contents. Uh, yes, I, I, I want, uh, probably one of the highlights of working with the Foundation, hearing this music, uh, being the first person to hear this music for 
the best part of 35 years is what a privilege. I think a couple of people might have picked up. I think there may have been a few hints at, uh, at some of our talks and some of our other events uh, about what this music contains. And uh, we're looking forward to finally sharing it with you in our Clash of the Titans soundtrack special. Excellent. Well, it, all it remains for me to ask you, Connor, is there any news updates we need to know about? We're getting a lot of interest and a lot of emails from people asking us about our centenary celebrations, our exhibition in Edinburgh at the National Galleries of Scotland. Um, all I can say for now is uh, keep your eyes peeled on Ray Harryhausen's 99th birthday, which uh, takes place later this month. Uh, it's the 29th of June. Uh, just just to take a look on our, our Facebook and our Twitter and um, social media in general. Our Twitter and our Facebook and our Instagram accounts for some updates on that. Um, I know a lot of you are very keen to to plan your summer holidays for 2020. Uh, we should have some some announcements and some news and some new material for you to delve into on the uh, 29th of June this year as a, as a way of marking Ray's 99th birthday and looking one year ahead towards what would have been his 100th birthday, his centenary. Well, I suppose the, uh, the the big update is uh, your your new book, John Harry House and the Lost Movies, because we have a a release date now that we can tell people about. September the tenth is the day to to mark, and and you can also pre order this uh, this new publication on all of Ray Harryhausen's movies. So we'll have plenty of updates about this over the summer because there's some very exciting material and some very exciting activities which will be happening alongside that book's release. Absolutely. So Harry House and the Lost Movies available via Amazon, uh, both .com and .co.uk and in other territories and also from the Forbidden Planets website, forbiddenplanet.com. Um, and as Connor said, yes, lots to talk about and lots to show and share with you. So until next time, thank you very much, Connor. It's been great uh, hearing from you as always. Thank you. I thought we could finish with uh, one final track from Simbad and Eye of the Tiger which is Melanthius, the, the theme for Patrick Troughton's character movie. And I think it's it's one of the tracks that always springs to mind whenever I think of Sinbad and Eye of the Tiger. This is the, the track which I suppose is, uh, is most memorable to me and one I think is perfect to play out on. Uh, so until next time, farewell. Copyright in the Ray Harryhausen podcast is owned by the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation, a registered Scottish charity, number SC001419, 2019. This recording may not be reproduced in whole or in part without written permission from the Foundation. The views expressed within these podcasts do not necessarily reflect those of the Foundation, its trustees or employees. For further terms and conditions, please contact us at rayharryhausen.com where you can also find our Facebook and Twitter links.